Uh, my name is Al Rogel, uh, and I'm moderating a panel uh, or two separate panels. Uh, picking up uh, right where uh, Rebecca left off, I have a saying that I like a lot, and she said it, so I'll reiterate, Dr. Google is not always your friend. So uh, we've asked um, our distinguished panel members to give an overview of their field of research, highlights of their research, and where they are headed in 10 or 12 minutes. <laughs> yes, and they all agreed. All of us, this is the important part, all of us will be available during this conference, some in the amphitheater right around the corner after this is over, because there are additional talks, and most will uh, present again. We are, including me, all quite approachable, so please ask your questions during these additional presentations, and really at any other time, you know, we'll share coffee, we'll do lots of other kinds of things that we are, in fact, available. So. All right, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to worry uh, about this. The first panel uh, is, con uh, consists of uh, Dr. Nicole Tartaglia, uh, Dr. Sophie Van Rijn, and um, uh, where's number three? Here we go, and Dr. Alan uh, Reis. Uh, Dr. Tartaglia is Associate Professor of Developmental and Behavioral Pediatrics at the University of Colorado. Uh, Dr. Van Rien is a clinical neurodevelopmental sciences uh, at uh, Leiden University in the Netherlands, and uh, Dr. Rees is a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the, and the Center for Interdisciplinary Brain Science Research at Stanford University. Uh, the slide that isn't up is a very short uh, outline of what they're going to talk about, so it's not important that we see those slides, and I will ask Dr. Tartaglia to uh, come up and give her uh, presentation, please. So if anyone knows me well, this is challenging for me not to talk for very long. <laughs> I just want to start very quickly by thanking um, AXIS and um, the Emory team and all the rest of the supporters who have put on this conference. It's such a pleasure to see everybody here and to be able to have this opportunity um, for all of us to grow and learn and share from each other. So I'm going to talk about the Extraordinary Kids Clinic research that's going on right now at our site in Colorado. Um, I want to start by just, um, you know, giving a little bit of background about um, my, my connection to the field. I was, um, like Rebecca, um, describing her early career, um, my early career, I was always very interested in how genetics affected neurodevelopment. And so after my pediatric training, um, I was... Um, um, drawn to the field of developmental pediatrics, which connects those, um, you know, aspects of how medicine and genetics um, affects um, brain development and behavior and all of those different aspects. And so um, to study this and learn more about um, th this connection, using different genetic disorders um, and conditions are a very nice model in terms of being able to, to understand and better understand these conditions. So I started with um, working on a project under the direction of Dr. Rondi Hagerman at the MIND Institute where I did my training in 2004, um, which is exactly 15 years ago, and I started with a group of patients, and my charge was to describe XXYY syndrome and how it was different than XXY syndrome and the rest of the X and Y variations. And so I went to camp in the mountains of Colorado, literally, and talked to families, um, some of them of which are here today, which is so fun to see, um, and talked to the patients themselves and talked and did testing and, you know, collected all these measures and basically learned about the experience of XXYY syndrome. Um, the... Um, woman who was um, the director of the XXYY project at the time, Renee Beauregard, felt very strongly when she received this funding that it was also really important for us to include all the rest of the variations. And so I also spent a lot of time that, that those next couple years talking to all the rest of the X and Y variation families, those who would come um, 
because they were having challenges with their children, those who would come with a prenatal diagnosis or were, who weren't having any challenges but just wanted to contribute to the research. And the research was conducted you know, in California, in Colorado, and then also all over the world where I traveled um, to talk with families about their experiences. And it was really um, a very enlightening um, experience for me and obviously led to a, um, a career um, dedicated to these conditions. When I was um, talking with all these families, and, and I really want to emphasize these because, you know, it's your voice that, that, that stimulates our research and that stimulates the questions that we need to answer in a lot of um, our research projects. And so when I was talking with families, really what became very clear is that families felt that the medical professionals, therapists, and educators usually knew very little about their children's genetic conditions a lot of times endocrinologists knew some stuff about the testosterone piece, but otherwise families felt like they were educating everyone about the conditions themselves rather than the other way around. Um, many who had had, especially a postnatal diagnosis, had experienced this, what we call diagnostic odyssey, um, prior to the sex chromosome variation diagnosis, with a lot of visits to a lot of professionals trying to figure out and understand what was going on. Um, many problems and needs that, um, that were identified really um, crossed the expertise of multiple disciplines. So there were medical and health needs and questions about the interplay of that with psychology. There were needs for you know, therapy, different types of speech therapy. There was definitely need for social work and connection with types of community types of services and the whole education field as well. Um, there was also a very marked spectrum of involvement, and we're going to talk a lot about this through the conference. Um, and there was a significant need for clinical research and updated publications to establish care guidelines and support families in getting the evaluations and services that they ne needed. So from this came, you know, my... Um, my next goal, which was really to develop a clinic to meet these needs. Um, and so when I started my faculty position at University of Colorado in 2007, we developed the Extraordinary Kids Clinic. Um, it was in my letter of offer. I said, I'm not starting unless you write down that you're going to support me in developing this clinic. They have supported me, not as financially as much as we'd love to, but they've definitely supported the idea and have continued to really support how important this um, clinic is um, and has been. I'm not going to talk about all the different aspects of the clinic. This is a very wordy slide, but it's basically our model that talks about all the different um, components of care that are needed to care for um, patients with X and Y variations. And on the bottom, you can see the strip of it's not just clinical care. We need to have coordinated research. We need to have ongoing education, and we're very lucky to be at a teaching hospital where we have not just medical trainees, but psychological trainees and trainees in all the different therapy um, um, professions as well. And then we obviously need a strong connection to the advocacy and support groups. Um, so my first paper was a paper about XXYY syndrome in, published in 2008. And then we just started from our clinical care and the research projects that we worked on internally and with a lot of collaborators nationally to describe other aspects. We described some of the clinical aspects that we found in terms of things like ADHD and autism, a lot of the behavioral and other social difficulties that were in the different conditions and some comparisons of those, you know, looking at trisomy X syndrome again and some of the other tetrasomy and pentasomy conditions. We started describing some of the medical features that we were seeing, such as things like tremor, um, and working um, on different genetic aspects of um, genes that were associated um, in different aspects of the condition. This one was one on the Shox gene in collaboration with the group from Denmark. Um, we are looking at, um, this is in collaboration with Judy Ross's group in terms of some of the genes associated with autism and XYY syndrome. And then we started, you know, really doing some research on a lot of the questions that families would have of us. How should I tell my child about the diagnosis? And so we've had awesome um, leadership of Susan Howell in our genetic counseling training program, doing a lot of different genetic counseling studies related to um, different aspects of, or of um, the X and Y variations. Um, 
and then thinking about you know the interplay of um, androgen therapy in those um, the groups that need androgen therapy and worked with Dr. Rogel on you know kind of considering how this is um, combined and how we think about it uniquely in in Kleinfelter syndrome and then really um, thinking about you know the different aspects of you know what what's different in my child who has a prenatal diagnosis of trisomy X and what, what how am I supposed to interpret the literature if I have a prenatal diagnosis compared to a postnatal diagnosis and this question would keep you know coming up for all the variations of, of how do I understand this literature and what are the important factors that are going to develop you know going to lead to differences um, in the outcomes of my child or how I'm going to know um, the severity of different levels of involvement. So we talk frequently about the spectrum of involvement, right? And there is a big spectrum of involvement across the variations. And the spectrum is not just in physical features such as height or other things, but it's also in the, um, the developmental and psychological features that present. And so when we're studying this, it becomes very challenging as a um, researcher because we know about that spectrum and want to make sure we capture that spectrum, but we also need to um, be able to focus on the, the, the components of that spectrum that do have the more significant challenges as well. And so, um, you know, this slide just really wants to um, point out, obviously, the spectrum that's there, but also kind of some of the challenges when we're doing research in that we take our whole population and any research we do on a population is a component right it's a it's just a piece it's a sample of that population and depending on where that sample comes from whether it's from clinic and or whether it's a prenatally ascertained group versus postnatally ascertained group there's always going to be biases and and different interpretations in terms of the research you're doing describing that sample or that component that may not describe the whole entire population and so there's always been you know this really um, deep need for the idea that we need to have prospective studies of um, people who were, you know, diagnosed immediately at birth to be able to follow and understand that. And there were a big, you know, a, a significant international effort in the 70s and 80s to identify babies by newborn screening and follow those babies all the way into adulthood to describe what we call the natural history of these conditions. And um, it was always kind of our dream to be able to repeat that. 30, 40 years later, um, when we have a lot more advanced technologies from the genetic perspective, and then also, you know, different views in terms of um, the involvement of the conditions. So at our site right now, we are involved in um, really trying to better understand um, the natural history of the X and Y variations, taking advantage of increased newborn screening that's been happening in these populations. So a lot of the families, you know, really want to know from us if I have a prenatal diagnosis and or once my child is born and or once my, you know, 27 year old baby is, a, is still my baby, you know, what's going to happen and how am I going to help them? And how am I going to know, um, you know, what that prognosis is in terms of this whole idea um, of the spectrum that can occur in the X and Y variations? So right now we have a really awesome study that's called the Extraordinary Baby Study. It's sponsored through the NIH, um, NICHD, and then in collaboration with a network um, there that is called the Newborn Screening Translational Research Network with the, with the idea of evaluating conditions that may be candidates to be identified by newborn screening. And the aims of our study are really to describe the profiles of the neurodevelopmental, medical, and hormonal features during the first three to four years of life for infants with Kleinfelter syndrome, XYY, trisomy X, XXYY, and all the others. Um, Grants from the NIH come in five-year cycles, so um, we are definitely interested in the lifespan, but we need to, you know, have an outcome for our first five-year grant, and so our first outcomes are at three to four years of age in terms of um, following these infants. Our goals are really to identify the risk factors and the early predictors of poor and positive um, neurodevelopmental and health, comes, health outcomes in the X and Y disorders. Um, we also are working to identify the best set of tools for primary care doctors to use to be able to help work with in terms of screening for the um, different features in these conditions. And we're also building a biobank of DNA, RNA, and other biological samples for future studies. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. The, um, 
the X and Y, this is our kind of big model of what, how we really see um, this research happening. And so um, there's a lot of words on here, but basically the idea is that these pieces over here on the left are the ideas that there are a lot of potential risk or protective factors that may play an important role in the outcomes of individuals with X and Y variations. And we need to better understand what those, um, the contribution of those factors are, including things, you know, like um, race and ethnicity, education, community supports, um, other medical factors like prematurity, birth weight, family histories, prenatal exposures, nutrition, and all the other background genetics. We also know that there are um, hormonal differences, and we need to really understand the variability, well, first, the profile of what that really looks like in a big cohort of patients early on, and then what those contributions are um, to um, developmental outcomes. And then um, thinking about really all the outcomes across all the different aspects of the conditions over the lifespan. So early childhood all the way on up through adulthood. And so our extraordinary baby study goes to early childhood, but the rest um, moves on from there. Participants come, they have, the requirements are that they have a prenatal diagnosis, um, they have to enroll at 12 months or younger, and they have vi study visits at two months, six months, 12 months, 18 months, two, three, four, five years of age. Um, there are two sites, we're the primary site in Colorado, but also working with Judy Ross and Karen and the team at Nemours um, for the second site in Delaware for the East Coast families. We have a big battery of procedures that we collect, a lot of history um, in terms of you know, family history and health history, developmental assessments that look at all different aspects of development, including standardized assessments and then some experimental assessments, including some eye tracking in collaboration with Dr. Van Ryn that we're gonna, um, she's gonna talk a little bit more about in her studies. Um, and then um, questionnaires and exam. We also are doing P-pod testing, which is looking at body composition um, in the infants, and then um, collecting biological samples to test hormones and also to build this biobank. Biobanks are very important. Um, in the idea that it's a bank of samples that can be used for future research. When the study's complete, we're gonna have this bank of samples and a very detailed database of all the medical and developmental assessments. And so the idea is that you can use this whole collection of data to answer new questions instead of having to go back and say, hey, I wanna study this new gene. Now I have to go collect all the patients and get all that information. So it allows us to ask new research questions using the data set um, that we have and studying the um, samples from there. Right now, we have a total of 101 babies who have enrolled in the study, and that is so cool. Our goal is to get to 200. Um, and so we're getting there. We clearly have a predominance of our XXY babies who are um, in the study, and we are really you know, encouraging anyone um, from the other groups where we don't have quite as many um, infants um, so far. And so um, we are very enthusiastic about getting there and, and having all the, we gotta have a halfway party um, now that we're there. We're still enrolling. Um, the participation includes travel to Denver or Philadelphia, including hotel and airfare. Um, a lot of fun interaction with our team, um, and then a re feedback report to, pr pr to provide to providers at home. And this is our team, and we thank you. We're gonna have a poster, um, and we're here all week to talk about it as well, all weekend. Thank you.